Welcome back. Well, we have three notebooks left and I really hope that I can finish them in this video. Pregnancy. Pregnancy. Now this is surprising. I can't say for sure, but it seems fairly clear that Dunny women were only fertile for one Dunny day every two Dunny months. In surface terms, that are roughly only 30 hours every 72 days. If true, it explains quite a few things. First, why there were so few children for people who lived 300 years, and secondly, the reason behind the rather large celebrations of pregnancy. As far as I can tell, these celebrations were usually limited to family members, although they were, although were rather large. There was quite a bit of prayer to Yavo, as well as blessings from the family members. These blessings usually included vows to care for the pregnant woman and child through the coming months. As I have mentioned in other areas, pregnant women were believed to be much more insightful, and as a result, part of the pregnancy experience, although not part of the official ceremony, was using that insight to gain revelation from Yavo. Though there was quite a bit of religious meditation expected from women during this time, I won't go into it here. However, this meditation was expected to primarily guide the women to their child's future, and its purpose was taken rather seriously. While pregnancy within marriage was cause for great celebration, the same cannot be said for pregnancy outside of marriage. As far as I can tell, any woman who became pregnant was expected to immediately marry and any child conceived out of wedlock was unable to join a guild for its entire life. As well, no revelation was expected from such a mother. This was as equivalent a curse as a lower class woman as her child would not be able to attend a guild of the upper class. As far as I can see, gestation was a full year. 10 Dunny months, 290 Dunny days, equivalent to one earth year. I have found no records of multiple births. Okay, well, the next one is maturity. Similar to a variety of other cultures, the Dunny celebrated the child's entrance into reason and maturity. The Dunny believed that true maturity, or the age of reason as they called it, was achieved at the age of 25. Before that, the Dunny believed that children's minds and hearts were not properly formed. Up until that time, they even went so far as to say it was impossible for a child to truly make a correct decision, as they were too easily controlled by other motives. That did not mean that what they were did was not right or wrong, but the Dunny believed that Javo did not hold them accountable for those decisions. After that point, it was apparently up to the parents to judge and protect, and thus another reason society encouraged couples to only have one child at a time under 25. In the ceremony of readiness, the Dunny celebrated the child's entrance into reason and maturity. At the ceremony, the child was presented with a bracelet of knowledge, also translated maturity. I have to admit the translation is somewhat poor and makes it sound like a magical or superstitious item, something it did not sound like to them. In fact, it was a fairly serious item. The Dunny viewed the bracelet as a sign of accountability. The individual, once given the bracelet, was expected to be responsible for his or her actions as he or she had true knowledge of good and evil, and the wisdom to make the right choices between both. Associated with the bracelet were certain rights as well as expectations to behave in a more correct manner. From a religious standpoint, the ceremony of readiness signaled accountability to Yavo as well as fellow Dunny citizens. No longer were parents judged for the actions of their children on a religious level, and no longer was lack of knowledge an excuse to Yavo. The maker, they believed, now expected much more from them. Though the age of reason was 25, the Dunny did not consider true wisdom to come until much later. With not nearly the fanfare that the age of reason brought, at 125 years of age there was another celebration for reaching the age of wisdom. Perhaps most importantly regarding that status, the Dunny were allowed to become the highest ranks of teachers and leaders, grand masters or lords. The same rules applied to women and no woman under the age of 125 was technically allowed to advise, especially the kings. As well, it appears that a woman's fertility ended around age 125. During the time of the kings, advisors were required for those kings who were under the age of 125, as the king himself had not achieved the age of wisdom. The great king Ashlandar was the only king who did not have an official advisor, even though he was under the age of wisdom for the majority of his reign. Okay, one more notebook, and it is on marriage. Much more than modern cultures, within Dani culture all citizens were expected to marry. In fact, it was even believed that marriage was an important part of a relationship with Yavo, as it taught and revealed the, necess the necessary requirements for such a relationship. Both marriage relationships and the relationship with Yavo were described by the same Dani word, Tegan. Literally translated, the word means to love with the mind, and implied a deep understanding, respect and most importantly unselfish love for one another. Obviously, the religious influence on most of Dunny culture was very strong, and, as a result, marriage was not something taken lightly. 
It was considered a lifetime commitment, and for Dunny, who could live to be 300 years old, it obviously was not the decision that Dunny felt should be rushed into, and it seems as though it rarely was. Some records point to rare arranged marriages, although for the most part it seems that the decision was up to individuals. Marriage was not permitted before the age of 25, and marriage between blood relatives was strictly forbidden. Though allowed, marriage between the classes was looked down upon. Marriage to other worlders was practically unheard of. I found certain writings from the 9000s going so far as to call the mixing of Dunny blood with outside cultures a travesty, while others wrote such a, or, uh, wrote such a child, who married an outsider, was better off dead. The marriage ceremony itself was not a single day event, but one that took over five days. Attendance to those sections of the ceremony to which one was invited was extremely important and it was considered a disgrace to be invited and not attend. The event usually began with a small ceremony held on the evening before the first day of the marriage ceremony. The ceremony always took sp place at the home of the groom, or his parents, and was meant to confirm, to both the bri confirm both the bride and groom's decision to be united to one another in front of their immediate family. The groom presented his bride-to-be with a gift representing the confirmation of his choice. The acceptance of the gift by the bride-to-be was acknowledgement of her decision. Immediately after her acceptance of the gift, the bride-to-be was escorted away with her family and not to be seen by the groom until the joining ceremony that would take place on the fifth day. The first day was meant for the bride and groom to spend time with their families. As they were starting their own family, their old family would no longer be the highest priority. Thus the day was set aside to spend time with that original family. Traditionally, the day ended with a large meal as well as speeches and blessings from the parents to the child. The second day was set aside for the bride and groom to spend with friends, both married and unmarried. Traditionally, one of the friends would host a large dinner at the end of the day. The third day was reserved for spending time with the soon-to-be in-laws. It was on the day that the bride and groom received blessings from their in-laws, as well as other members of the family. Again, there was a traditional larger meal at the end of the day, marked by speeches from the eventual in-laws and other soon-to-be family members. The fourth day was meant for the couple to spend time alone with Javo individually. Though many apparently viewed the day as a formality, others viewed it as the most significant of all the days. The day was often filled with prayer, asking for Javo's blessings upon the event, as well as time to understand Javo's desires for their new lives together. It was also considered a time to purify themselves before Javo. Some chose to spend time with the priests or prophets, while others read the holy books and talked to Javo himself. The fifth day was the day of joining. The early portion of the day was set aside for physical preparation, while the la later part of the day was set aside for joining ceremony itself. For those who did not have access to private ages, the ceremony usually took place on marriage ages. For the upper classes, the ceremony took place in family ages. All family was expected to attend, as were fellow guild members. All of those in attendance were divided into two sides. One side represented the groom, while the other represented the bride. Between the two sides, in the center, were a long aisle and a triangular podium. The bride and groom would each approach this, their side of the podium by walking through their respective family and friends. It was, after all, those family and friends who had made the bride and groom what they were, and the Dunny believed it was those family and friends who should present their bride or groom to their spouse. The priestess usually stood on the third side of the podium. As with most important events, and especially marriage, the bride and groom wore the bracelets they had been given at birth as well as maturity. After the bride and groom arrived to the platform, the father of the bride would remove the bride's bracelets and give them to the groom. The Dunny believed the giving of the bracelets represented the giving of the bride's purity and adulthood to the groom. A short speech often followed the event. The father of the groom would follow the father of the bride with the identical procedure, giving his son to the bride. The giving of the children was followed by an expression of both parents of their blessings upon those being joyed, as well as of those present. Symbolically, the bride and groom then switched sides to represent of an acceptance of all the bride's family and friends of the groom and vice versa. Both the bride and groom then handed all four bracelets to the priestess. While the priestess led the couple through their commitment to one another in Javo, the bride and groom placed their hands upon the podium. During the commitments, the couple made promises to one another and uh, followed by promises to Javo. All were recited aloud to the priestess. The priestess usually reminded the couple that marriage was a reminder of Tegan to know with the mind, and that their love should, be all, should always be a representation of their love for Javo. Following the commitments, the priest would place two new and larger bracelets upon the bride and groom. The groom's was placed upon the left wrist and the bride to the right wrist. Uh, the, right wrist. the new bracelets were meant to represent both the purity and maturity bracelets their spouse had previously worn. The dunny emphasized that the spouse was now your responsibility to keep pure and knowledgeable of good and evil. 
The bracelets were meant to be a constant reminder of that responsibility, as well as a commitment to maintain the best for that spouse. Well, as it seems I cannot finish this uh, notebook in this video, now, uh, it seems that we'll need one more video to finish this.